Hi everybody, this is Steven, also known as Knitfen on Instagram and Ravelry, and you are watching the Mingled Yarncast. Welcome, uh, and Happy New Year. So this is the first uh, filming that I've done this year so far, and I've got lots of things to talk to you about, so let's get right to it. Um, first of all, it's been a while since my last video, and part of that reason, and part of the reason it might be a little while between this one and the next one, is that I've got a couple of other projects that I'm working on right now, um, non-knitting, although knitting related, um, that are taking up quite a bit of time. However, I will get back to you soon, I promise. Um, the first thing that will be coming up in February, for those of you who are in the New York City area, is my choir, Master Voices, is going to be performing at Radio City Music Hall for um, a screening of The Lord of the Rings that features the, um, a live orchestra and live chorus singing the soundtrack. So it's going to be really cool. It's four nights and it's selling out. So apparently there's a big audience for this. I didn't know. Um, and uh, I'm told that it's a lot of fun. People dress up. It's going to be quite the night. But in the meantime, there's quite a lot of rehearsal leading up to that. So that's one thing that's taking up most of my evenings for the next couple of weeks. And then the other thing is that I have <laughs> I've committed to writing a novel. Uh, I'm a member of the Jersey City Writers Group, and they, um, they have a workshop series called The Full Story. And it is for people who are writing novels, and they would like beta readers to be the first to read and give critique on the novels. So um, you sign up, and they schedule everything pretty much a year in advance. Or they schedule the whole year at once, I should say. My date is in April, so I have got to finish this book that I'm writing by then. So, yeah. However, um, I would like your help, actually. So the novel that I'm writing, I started this um, November of 2021, and it was at a writing retreat, and it's a murder mystery. It's set within a sort of elite knitting community. Um, of movers and shakers and influencers and whatnot. Um, it is not analogous to anything that I really am aware of in the real world. Um, however, uh, I, I've made it up in my mind. So in my, my story, there is a, a very elite group. There is a murder that happens within that group. And so it is essentially a knitting murder mystery. Now, I know there are authors who have done these kinds of stories before. It's, I'm not the first to blaze that trail, but uh, I haven't read any of them myself. So I'm very curious to know from you, uh, dear audience, if you were to read this book or if you were to be handed a knitting murder mystery, what would you want to see? What kinds of things do you expect given that genre description. Uh, what would make it fun for you? Because obviously it has to be more than just a murder mystery. It has to have some knitting involved. So what would you like to read about? That's what I would like you to tell me, please, in the comments. Um, I'm re very, very open to the suggestions. I've got about eh, less than 10,000 words written, so I'm still at the beginning, uh, and there's time to add some things. So if you have something you would love to see in a knitting murder mystery, then do let me know. And uh, who knows, maybe it will find its way into the story. So having said that, I thought I would um, talk a little more about books today. Um, lots of knitting to come, don't worry, but just a, a brief diversion into the literary world. I've probably said this before, but my actual educational background is in literature. I have a, a master's degree in literature, and I teach English. So books are a big, important part of my life, as well as yarn. and. Um, the origin of this story that I'm working on actually comes from, um, well, a, a couple of things. Uh, it, it's sort of an homage or a love letter to the pandemic period when we were all on Zoom. And despite all of the pain of that, there were, I'm sure we would all admit, some good things to come from it. And um, for me, one of those was returning to knitting. I I'd learned 15 years before, but I would stopped doing it in a regular way. So I picked that up and I discovered knitting Instagram. That was a new thing to me at that point in time. And um, it opened up a whole lot of creative valves. <laughs> and um, so anyway, I, that, that's what I, where I was sort of creatively and mentally at that point in time. 
at that point in time, by the way, I couldn't write and I didn't want to read at all. I don't know if you had something that you loved that just, I don't know, when we were all trapped at home, you'd think it'd be a great time to read, but it was the last thing that I wanted to do. Um, so I didn't. I know people that wrote many novels during that time. I didn't write a word. Barely even wrote in my journal. I don't know. I was I was knitting, though, and that gave me happiness. But anyway, um, I did eventually start taking some classes that forced me to read some things, and one of them was an Agatha Christie class, and another one, uh, just before that, was a class on sensationalist literature, um, which is a very specific genre um, or subgenre that uh, was popular in the 1860s in England, books like Lady Audley's Secret and um, things of that nature, mostly very domestic, very um, filled with characters who have secrets, who betray each other, who are, um, you know, scoundrels. And um, anyway, with that, Agatha Christie, sensationalist literature, the pandemic lockdowns, all of this knitting, all of these things find their way into this story. The style is kind of Victorian, and um, at least in terms of the narration, and the, the storyline takes place in the 2020s, so that's not Victorian. But um, in any case, the, the, there's a, a sensibility to it, I hope, that will come across in the tone and, and the style of the writing itself. But uh, anyway, yeah, that's that, that's my, I, I look forward to sharing that with you all one day. My, my love letter to you. And in preparation for it, I have been reading some more Agatha Christie. It's been about a year since that class. And um, so right now I'm in the middle of, or really kind of near the beginning of, first couple of chapters at Bertram's Hotel. Um, if you are not familiar with Agatha Christie, like I'm sure you've heard of her, even if you've never read her, but if you've never read her, do. Um, when I picked this up at the bookstore the other day at Little City Books in Hoboken, there was a little sign that said, um, one of the workers wrote it and they, they said, you know, every time I pick up an Agatha Christie novel, I ask myself, why do I ever read anything else? And it's kind of true. I feel that way too. And I've said those exact words almost in the past because uh, I go through phases where I'm reading lots of Christie. And uh, when I'm in those phases, I'm a very happy reader. They're just entertaining books. Um, they, they move. They've, they've got, they've got a, a, a voice and a style that's so unique and fun. And I mean, they get categorized as cozy mysteries. I suppose there's a coziness in that narrative voice, but they ain't, uh, they ain't pretty. Like, there's some grisly stuff that happens in these stories. So don't think, just because she's a sweet English lady, that she's going to spare you the bloody, gory drama. She does not. Um, but anyway, this is the one I'm reading now Miss, uh, at Bertram's Hotel. And I have chose this one because it's a Miss Marple story. And Miss Marple is not a uh, detective by trade. She's not a professional detective. And yet she finds a way to insert herself into all of these crimes and mysteries. And that's what I needed for my character because my character is not a police officer, not a detective, not anything related to criminal justice. So um, I wanted to pay attention to how does she do that? Like how does Miss Marvel <laughs> busybody her way into uh, all these different narrative plots? Um, because I need to figure that out myself. So that's the one thing. Now, this one is knitting related. Um, I picked this up recently, ordered it online, um, the Lopa Pesa sweater. This is by, I think you can see the names pretty clearly, but Tony Carr, AKA Joan of Dark, and Kyle Cassidy, who I believe did the photographs. And um, this book is, is just gorgeous and it's fun. It's gorgeous in the way it looks. I mean, you can tell from the, the atmospheric photo on the cover um, that it's got a mood, right? But um, inside it, story time. There are patterns, as you would expect to see in a knitting book. Um, quite a few of them, actually, and, and gorgeous photos of the, uh, the projects and the models, et cetera, et cetera, with some beautiful scenery. But the beginning of the book is really, um, it's kind of a travel log. It's, it's the author and the photographer just telling the story of making the book, telling the story of the people that they've met. And um, I'm really, really enjoying it. I'm not done with it yet, so maybe I'll weigh in again when I do finish it. But um, 
I've been wanting to go to Iceland now for a while. I have quite a few friends who've gone, and maybe you have too. Maybe you've been there. In fact, if you have been there, let me know and tell me uh, what I should definitely not miss. But in any case, um, yeah, this even if you have been there, this book I think will be a nice addition to your bookshelf. And um, it will give you lots of information that, well, maybe you know some of it, but I doubt you know it all. Um, because there's a lot here, and it's really, really cool. So, again, that is the Lopa Pesa sweater. Oh, and I will um, actually feature this again, because I have not made, I guess I've not made a true traditional Lopa Pesa, or a um, Lopi, but I have, um, I have followed the design for one using um, sort of yarns from, from here, um, not the traditional Lopa Pesa yarn, which, as I understand, is a bit... Um, What's the word I'm looking for? Not difficult to use. Well, difficult if you're not used to it, but um, it requires different tension, different uh, management of the yarn because it's sort of fluffier and more given to tear. So you really have to know how to handle it. And um, anyway, so what, what I have made, my, my Lopeza is um, just with sort of American yarns. But anyway, still in the style. And it's really beautiful, and I love it. But I'll share that with you next time. Well, in a, a time or two, because <laughs> I've got to finish the book, too. So that is my book share. Um, a little bit of fiction, a little bit of knitting proper, and, um, and then, of course, my own work. So now let's, let's switch gears. Let's talk some knitting, shall we? Um, in the previous episode, I had a lot of questions uh, written down by Lisa Vitale, who is, show notes, um, you can find her on Instagram at happy when knitting or reading. That is at happy when knitting or reading. See, reading is a theme today. Um, and anyway, she left me um, a bunch of questions, and I thought, you know what, that is some good content uh, creation right there, because sometimes when I'm starting a video, I don't know what I'm going to talk about, despite writing down notes, but having some questions to address makes things easier. So um, I'm going to go through these one by one. And um, I actually used the questions to kind of shape uh, the format for today, or in terms of what I was going to share of whips and finished objects. So first question is, who is your favorite designer? That's very tricky. Um, well, in the one sense, it's not tricky. Uh, if I were just to go by the designer whose designs I have made the most often, it would have to be hands down Stephen West because I've made, I, I counted it before, uh, I think it's seven of his shawls and I have the yarn and the pattern already bought for the one I'm going to do next. So. Um, yeah, just by data alone, I would have to go with Stephen West. But it's, I, yes, I love making those shawls, but I don't know if I would say that, I don't know if I would choose anybody as my favorite designer above all. I would say that I really, of course, truly do like his, his work. Um, but I like others too. Um, and for example, I've not made any of Stephen West's sweaters yet, although I do have some of them in my queue. Um, Sweater-wise, in terms of um, things that I've made, I seem to have divided myself pretty evenly because <laughs> I think I have six, six sweaters I've made that I've followed the patterns for, and two of those were Jared Flood, and two of those were Maxim Sear, and two of those were uh, Josh Bennett. So um, I guess maybe I could say overall I do have a tendency maybe going for male designers, but mostly because I'm making stuff for myself and I like their aesthetic and, um, and they're designing for the male body. But um, who knows? Um, of those currently, what you see me in right now is my very first sweater. I'll stand here so you can see a little better. Um, this is the So Basic Sweater by Maxim Sear. And um, I thought I would maybe just focus in on him today because I have uh, couple of things I can show you. Um, this was the very first sweater that I made. I made it during the lockdown and I um, had never made a sweater before. It was called the So Basic Sweater. That seemed, you know, like a good first sweater project. So at that period in time, I ordered my uh, yarn online from Pearl Soho and this is Pearl Soho's own line. It's called um, Line Weight. 
Uh, it's a fingering weight yarn, uh, which, you know, would I recommend that you do your very first sweater with fingering weight? I mean, you know, yes. The, the drawback, of course, is that it takes a lot longer. Um, but it is a finer texture and a finer um, textile. Um, this particular yarn, I think you can see it a little bit here because it looks a little uneven on the screen. It's because it's pilling quite a bit. But you know what? I, I know there are scrapers and things that you can do to clear that up. But I don't want to because I actually really like the way it looks. I think it looked, it's, it's pilled very evenly. And somehow or other, where it has pilled, it's brought out the yellow in the green. And so you can't see it on there, but it, up close you can. There's, it, it gives it this kind of golden aura, which is really cool. Um, I like this sweater because it has some very basic designs. Um, I mean, it's not entirely stockinette. It's mostly stockinette, but you can see in the, I think, yeah, you can see on the sweat, the shoulders here, that there is a, um, a series of, of pearl lines going down so that you get a nice raglan effect. There we go. And um, it's, it, it's totally comfortable. The only thing that I wish I had known when I was making it is that... Um, Okay, so it says in the pattern to cast off in, what are they, what's, what's the phrase? Cast off in pattern, which for the collar or for the sleeves is um, a one by one rib. So I'm sure most of you probably know this, but for those who might not, um, casting off in pattern means if you are, as you're casting off, um, you follow the pearl and the, the knit. So you, you, just change how you're doing it based on if the next stitch is a purl stitch or a knit stitch. And I did that and <laughs> it was, this, well, first of all, the sleeves are very tight. Um, everything that I see other people say online, they say casting off in pattern makes for a stretchy cast off. Not when I do it. Um, it is not really stretchy at all. And in fact, the neck, now it's, it's fine. Um, but when I first did it, it was so tight I couldn't get my head through it. So that's a problem with a sweater. You do have to get your head through it. But um, yeah, th so I, what I don't love about this currently is that I can't really, well, actually, this, I was going to say I can't roll my sleeves up. This is as far as they will go, and it's really, really tight. And I like to roll my sleeves up. I pretty much do that all the time. Um, so I can't really do that. And yes, I do know that I can take out the, uh, the cast off. But the problem is that this is now about two years old. And I have worn it a bit. Um, and all of the, the cuffs have kind of felted together. Like I can't find, I can't really find the end anymore. I would have to cut it. And then I would have, it, it just sounds like too much labor, frankly. Um, but I did learn my lesson moving forward <laughs> that um, I cannot do that type of bind up. And I've tried it on other times with other projects. Every single time I undo it and I go, okay, why did I think that was going to work? It never works. So I end up now, of course, just doing um, Jenny's surprisingly stretchy bind off instead. And that works every time. So that's my go-to now. But this was my first sweater, and I didn't know that. So that was something that I learned from making this. Uh, the pattern calls for making a pocket here. I opted not to do the pocket, but of course you can if that's your thing. Um, what else can I tell you about it? Maybe that's it. Um, the second finished object that I want to share with you is this one, and I'm sure many of you have seen this before. It's very, very popular. This is uh, Max Sears For Fox Sake sweater. And let's see here. You can see it is a, oops, a yoke sweater with a bunch of little fox heads with glasses on. So these are presumably very intelligent foxes. And uh, yeah. <laughs> Here, I will put it on. Give me one moment. And we're back. So um, now you can see it on uh, the way that it goes around the bend there. And this was a wonderful project um, for a couple of reasons. Uh, it was my very first color work project ever. And I would 
maybe not recommend that it be your first color work project. As much as I love it, um, there are quite a number of places through here where it involves three different colors at once. And um, I'd never done color work at all, so I had never mastered two. I jumped right into three. <laughs> and um, the only reason that that's a problem is that it, my, my tension was very, very off. There was a period in time where I thought, oh, God, is this even going to fit me? And it does. Um, but but uh, I think it looks okay. Yeah, it looks fine. However, um, because my tension was off in the yoke, you can't see it. But underneath here, there's lots of floats, and this is very, very thick. And um, sometimes, let me see if I can make it happen as I move around. Actually, it's kind of behaving and it's draping well, but sometimes anyway, this gets, now you can see it, like this is bunching up. <laughs> the yoke is bunching up into my collar a little bit um, because it's, it's thicker. It feels a little more like, um, not cardboard, that's not the right term. Uh, it's not like that, but it is definitely thicker than you know, the stockinette portion below. And uh, I can feel it. I guess that's what I'm saying. I, I can feel the difference pretty dramatically. Although now, like I said, over time it has stretched out and actually it fits really, really well. So um, let me uh, get back here again so you can see more of it. But yeah, I, I, I really love it. It's, it's fun. It always gets a comment and a laugh. And see, I figured out this time about the sleeves. So I can roll them up and I'm very happy about that. Uh, because you know what, as I just took off that green sweater, it was covered in sweat. <laughs> That's why I need to put my sleeves up, just to let some coolness, cool air uh, filtrate the, the sweater. Anyhow, um, like I said, this has been an incredibly popular sweater. Um, I was tracking it on Instagram for a while before I decided to finally um, do it. And I, and I knew at the time, I said, this has got to be my, my very first color work because it looks like so much fun. But like I said, it was hard. I had to, a lot to learn in making it. And um, it took me a very long time, not entirely, not because of, um, well, it, I stopped at, at a certain point. It, it got to be really, really difficult. And I put it down for a couple of months and then I picked it up again. So I don't remember when I, the, my start date and my finish date was, but it was, there was a big gap in between. Um, however, now, I'm sure if I were to try it again, I would have a very different experience. And anyway, it did turn out. And these are the colors that um, he mentions in the pattern and the yarn as well. It's a Madeline Tosh uh, DK twist, I think. Let me check, because I wrote it down. And since I wrote it down, I don't want to tell you wrong. Madeline Tosh DK twist, 100% merino. Um, but anyway, I used the exact colors, uh, except for one. There was one they were out of, so I got the next closest thing, and I can't remember which one it was. Maybe the, the whitish, grayish color. I'm not sure. Um, but anyhow, that uh, I, got me to skip ahead into the finished objects, but that was based on Lisa Vitale's question, who's your favorite designer? So Maxim Sear is certainly one of them. And if you don't follow him, you should. You can find him on Instagram at Max the Knitter. Max the Knitter. Okay. Then she asks, what is your favorite yarn brand? I don't know. Um, I, I've actually used Madeline Tosh as a DK twist on several projects, and that's because of this sweater, uh, because I like the feel of it so much and um, the breathability, and um, just found that as I was working with it, it... It felt so good in my fingers, and it, the, the final product looked so good. And the stitch definition is beautiful, so yeah, I really do like that particular yarn, and I have used it other times. However, um, that was just because I followed this pattern and I knew about this yarn, therefore I stuck with it for a few more times. I wouldn't say that I'm so well-versed in so many yarns um, that I can speak, to, speak in an educated way um, about them. But this is one that I like. So I guess I'll go with that. Again, just going by data, since I've used it in several <laughs> different, um, different projects, then I guess it can count as a favorite. 
Favorite fiber? Um, wool, alpaca, etc., etc. Um, I'm going to stay pretty basic with this one and say wool. I, I really, really do like the feel of it. I really love, love, love learning about where the wool comes from, the farms, the sheep, the farmers, the place, the land, uh, the history, all of that really, really excites me. And I'm, I'm kind of like that with a lot of things too. I love to read about wines, for example. I like to learn about the wine regions, the people, the producers, et cetera, et cetera. I, I, I get excited by the story, I guess. And um, same with wool. So I, I like to do a deep dive in research to, you know, sources and where it comes from and, and whatnot. Um, I love that it, you know, if it needed to degrade, it will degrade very quickly. Um, I think that's kind of cool. And I like sheep. There you go. But I also, you know, of course, like other uh, animal fibers too, alpaca. I just made some mitts uh, for my mom for Christmas out of alpaca, and uh, it was beautiful. And uh, so, 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 so soft, so buttery. And uh, I, I, I loved it. So that was really, really a special project to work on. And, and hopefully, they're keeping her hands warm as well. Um, but at the end of the day, I'm going to stick with wool. And I like that there are so many different varieties of it. And you can, there's so much you can do with it. So there you go. See, I'm not wishy-washy about that one. Um, patterns that I've made multiple times. How many are there patterns that I've made multiple times? So those mitts that I just mentioned, I made two pairs of those already, and I'm going to make another. Um, I will try to throw a picture up here so you can see it. I don't have them to show you because they were gifts, and so they've been given away. But, um, yep, I made those twice, and I'm going to make a third pair for uh, another ant. And um, other than that, things that I've made multiple. Most of the bigger projects I have not. Uh, I do have socks that I've made the same pair a few times. And um, back in my earlier days, sort of my intermediate phase of knitting, I there was a baby blanket pattern that was a circular one. Um, you know what? I'm going to pause this here. I'm going to go get that blanket for you. OK, um, this baby blanket. Isn't that cool? Um, as you can see, sorry, as you can see, um, it's it's a spiral. It starts from the middle here and uh, goes out. And, and I've probably made this, I think this is the fourth one. And I made this one for myself because every time I made one for a new baby, I was like, oh, I want this. And it's the perfect size to just uh, kind of go on my lap and uh, having said everything I just said about wool, this is acrylic. Um, I think, yeah, the, the yarn, something I got at Michael's, and um, it's it's very soft and it's lovely, and I, uh, yeah, I've made this a bunch of times, but not recently. I haven't made it in a few years. Maybe it's time for another one. Um, now that I know more about technique and I know more about different fibers, maybe it's time to do this again in a completely new way. So we'll see. I hadn't thought about that until just now, but I think that might be fun. Okay, um, next question was, what is your least favorite thing to knit? Uh, I don't know. Because if, I mean, if I don't like doing it, I don't do it. So, <laughs> um, I don't know if I, and I've liked everything I've ever made, so I don't know if I've discovered the thing that I don't like to make. Oh, by the way, I don't know if I've shown you this mug before. If I have, stop me. Sorry, you can't because it's a video. But um, anyway, this is from Grayling Ceramics, which is a, a, a ceramic company that I discovered on Instagram. And I saw this in, uh, on Instagram, and I thought, oh, my God, I must have this because I don't know if you recognize where that is, but these are the Great Lakes. And you can see Michigan and down here, Ohio and uh, Wisconsin and Minnesota and all of that over there. Um, and it's, a, it's part of the country that I love, have very, very fond memories of spending time around Lake Erie and the other lakes as well. And uh, I'm drinking my Moroccan mint tea out of this mug from Grayling Ceramics, which you will find online. And they are based out of Kalamazoo, Michigan. 
and it's my favorite mug. <laughs> anyway, um, what was I saying? It's the least favorite thing to name. Um, nothing, nothing. I don't have a least favorite thing. I have things I've never done. Like I've never made washcloths. I've never made hand towels. Um, I've never took the time to do little functional daily things like that, which it's not because I don't like them. I just <laughs> haven't done that. Um, yeah, yeah. I'm going to skip that one because I like it all. Okay, the last one. This is a very interesting one. Um, Lisa asks uh, to give you three of my top tips and techniques that every knitter should be doing right now. So that was, that was an interesting question. Um, and I had to think about it, so I wrote down some answers. Here, here's what I've got for you. Number one, uh, invest, if, if you're very serious about knitting and you're gonna do it for a while, then invest in good needles. N not all needles are uh, equal. I discovered that because I had the ones that I started with, which I think were bamboo, and then I had some that were aluminum, and they were fine, they got the job done, but they wore down very quickly over time. And I wasn't knowledgeable enough to realize that it was making things harder uh, for me to do. And then I got some new ones for a different project. Uh, I think it was like a, a pair of Chowgu cable needles for a, a, a big uh, shawl project. And anyway, those things were so sharp and so fine and the ease with which I was able to knit. I mean, it, it goes, it's not, that, it's not that it's faster. It is faster, but that's not the reason why it's better. It's a smoother process. It just feels different. And I think it's important to remember that so much of this art form is, um, it's about the aesthetic experience of making it. It's not just about the product, but it's about all of the hours that you've spent with this yarn in your hand and with these needles. And the whole time you're feeling it, right? It's, it's handwork, it's a handiwork. So um, paying attention to how things feel, I think is really, really important. And the feel of the needles as I'm knitting with them uh, was so much nicer than the um, like the alu aluminum on aluminum that sort of clinking clinking and then scratching against each other sound it was you know so I, I used them for many many years but over time I realized oh this is unpleasant so let me try something new um, but you know when I was first starting out I was not ready to invest uh, in in needles like that in uh, like I have now, but um, if you are at that point, then definitely, definitely, definitely get yourself uh, a very nice pair of needles. And I would love for anybody to put in the comments, what are your favorites? Um, I use mostly Chowgu. Well, mostly just because um, I got a set of them, an interchangeable set, and I use it for everything. I don't have multiple sets of needles. I know some people do, um, but... Yeah, it, it, it's what I've got, and for now it's what I like to use, but I would love to hear what you like to use and uh, why, what's your reason. So that's the one thing. Uh, first tip is to get good needles. The second tip uh, would be to get yourself a Swift and Winder. Um, that changed my life, especially if you start using, it's, it's one thing if you're getting, you know, the acrylic yarn that I got at Michael's that I made this blanket from, um, it's already in a ball and you can pull from the center or from the side or however you want, but it comes ready to go. You can use it right out of the store. But if you're getting, um, you know, yarn from an indie dyer or um, from, you know, nice wool from your local yarn shop, then uh, of course it comes in skeins or hanks and it comes in other forms that are not usable until you wind it up into a ball. And I was doing that by hand for a long time. Just, <laughs> I would put it on the, around a chair and I would sit here winding the thing in by hand uh, with the chair. And that was kind of fun by itself. Like that was its own experience. But on a project like a Stephen West shawl, where you have lots of different colors, you got to wind all of them into a ball. Um, if you're doing it all at once, it's time consuming. Like that can take hours actually. Uh, but with the Swift and Winder, it takes minutes. And um, that's also a fun process because you're turning that little crank and it's spinning, and then all of a sudden you've got this cake, and you can pull it from the center, you can pull it from the side, you can do whatever you want. And uh, yeah, I like it. It's fun. <laughs> so get yourself one of those. That was 
advice number two. Um, advice number three is very practical, I think. Um, and I want to, I've got to find the project. I thought I was all prepared, but I'm not. I'm going to pause this again. Back again and better than ever. So um, this is, I, I think I shared this in the last video. Apologies if I didn't, but this is the painting chevrons <laughs> shawl, which I'm doing as a scarf. It's a Stephen West pattern. Um, now, but that's, uh, that's not the tip. The tip is this. So as you can see from this pattern, um, there are several different sections. Um, I guess four paneled sections plus the little tags on the side, right? And the way that you get the chevrons to happen at all is through a series of calculated increases and decreases. Now, when I first started doing this, um, which was back in August, actually, I just used the stitch markers to mark the, the sections willy-nilly. And uh, the colors were all mixed up. I just placed a marker. I didn't care what marker. But as I was knitting this, I found that um, I couldn't remember. Like, is this a decrease section? Is this an increase section? I, I was getting totally confused. And then I have to look at it and be like, OK. Um, so I decrease at the start, then I increase, then I decrease, then I increase, then I decrease. And um, as I was working with it, and I, I was using all of these same stitch markers. You can see they're mostly orange and blue-green. And um, I thought, wait a minute. Let's work smarter, not harder. So I, I color-coded them. Ah, genius, right? Um, well, it took me a while to figure this out. But uh, where there is orange, I decrease. And where there is green, because green is fertility and fecundity, um, I increase. <laughs> so um, now when I'm doing this, I have a lot less thinking to do um, and a lot less counting to do. So um, it wasn't a matter of just putting a stitch marker to say, here's a new section. The stitch marker is also visually telling me when to increase and decrease. So that's uh, another thing. And I've done that on other projects as well, which would lead you to believe that I would have thought to do this sooner than I did but I didn't. But on other projects where, um, especially if you're doing something in garter stitch, where the front and the back, the right side and wrong side look the same, um, and when you pick it up, sometimes you got to figure out, okay, is this right? Is this wrong? Where did I leave off? So with things like that, if it involves, even if it doesn't involve sections, I might just put a garter stitch, uh, or I'm sorry, not a garter stitch, a stitch marker at the beginning or at the end. But if there are, are sections, then I, I have so many stitch markers at this point, and they're in all different colors, so I just put them in the order of the rainbow, Roy G. Biv, and um, that way I know when I'm knitting and I hit the red, the orange, the yellow, the green, that's the front, and then on, on the back, in reverse, I'm going purple, blue, green, et cetera, et cetera. And that's what I do with that. So uh, that's my third tip for you, is to use your stitch markers strategically and thoughtfully and to do whatever you can to make the project a little bit easier for you. You don't want it too easy, but you don't want to, you know, you don't want to make things difficult where they don't need to be, such as life. So <laughs> um, that is the last question. So thank you, Lisa Vitale. That, um, that was fun, and I, I, I enjoyed that. And so if anybody else has any other questions, of course, go, please ask away. I will do my best to answer them in the future and um, give you a shout out when I do. Okay, um, well, you know what? I was gonna next show you my work in progress and then show you my FOs, but I already showed you the FOs when we were talking about designers. So um, again, that was the for Fox sake sweater and the very sweaty, so basic sweater. <laughs> you can't see the sweat though. I hope not. Um, so we've done that. But I will show you my current um, work in progress. And I'm very, very excited about it. And many people are excited about it because this, uh, this shawl has generated a lot of conversation on Instagram. It's not even done. Um, this is the Lava Lake shawl. And I showed you the yarns for this the other day. These are the yarns that I picked up in Atlanta at the Craftivist. Um, but let's see if I can really get this all in here. 
Okay, see how big this bad boy is? It's halfway done. It's going to be twice as big. In fact, it's not even halfway done yet. It's about 47% done. Um, but anyway, I am just... Sorry, I keep looking because I'm like, I don't want to knock a tree over. <laughs> I am in love with this project. And um, the... Uh, I'm just moving it around so you can see it at different angles. So uh, I... I, I I should be working on the scarf because that's a gift and I want to get it done while it's still cold. But I put it down because for some reason, some reason I don't know, um, this piece has just been calling to me. These yarns have been calling to me. And um, I don't know, for some reason I just felt like I need to work on this. This is what I need to do. Not want, I need to work on this right now. And um, so I put down everything else and I just cast this on. And at first I just wanted to get started. I just wanted to see the yellow bit and how that looked. And then of course it segues into the, the green section. Now, something to note, see this, this section between my fingers is, is the green and the yellow. But here, this is a blend of the two. So in the end, they look very similar, right? It's hard to see that there's a change, but there is a change because at this point the yellow drops out and then it's just the yellow green blend. And then we get into the blue and the black, which is actually a very, 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 very dark navy. And in some lights it looks blue and some lights it looks black. Um, but anyway, uh, yeah, I just, I needed to do it. And I wondered, do you have any projects like that? Do you have a project that you're just like, this is it. Everything else clear the way. We need to change our focus, get this done now. Um, I, I, I'm not generally like that. I generally, I, there are times when I've had several things going at once, but I generally like to finish something um, as I'm, as, that I start. <laughs> but um, no, for this, it, it was calling to me. And I, part of me thinks, um, I really want to wear it while I'm writing. I really want to like have this done to work on the novel with because I want to you know just wrap up in it and sit in my computer with my tea and uh, I, I just I can't wait to see what this is going to be like when it's done because I love it so much now and um, like I said I've been posting a few, some pictures of it on Instagram and it, people have been really reacting positively to it. There's just something about these colors that, that I don't know, they work. Sometimes you, you get it right, you know? <laughs> I think I got it right with this one. But uh, anyway, that's what I've been working on now. And I can't wait to be able to show you the finished product. By the way, in case you can't tell, I mean, why would you be able to tell? Because you don't see the pattern. Um, it starts at this end. It goes towards the middle. So as it gets darker, it gets longer. And you can't see this probably, but let me see if you can. Eh, I don't think it shows on the, the camera here, but I've got the next color on here. It's a very dark purple and it's very similar to the navy blue. Um, so there's one more color coming in and it, it creates a triangle. Yeah. <laughs> this camera reverses everything and I can't really <laughs> deal with it. But anyway, um, here we go. Okay, so this is one end. It goes through here, and after I add the purple section, it's going to all reverse and go until... So both ends will be yellow. And um, yeah, so as it hangs on my over my shoulders, it will be something like this. And then the darker colors will hang down in the back. And I can't wait. So um, that's, that's that. And that may be my show. Now, where did my notes go? There they are. Let me just double check, make sure I didn't leave anything out. No, that's it everybody that is our show for today and today by the way is the 22nd of january and hopefully i will have this edited and up 
possibly today, but if not, um, in the next day or two. So uh, as I did last time, um, I wanted to end with a poem. And what I did today is, uh, as I've been working on this Lava Lake shawl, I, the, one of my very favorite poems just kind of runs on repeat in my head as I'm working on this because it, it I don't know, there's just something about it that really makes me think of Rilke. And so I made a little video that I'm gonna um, edit into here for our poem, but the poem this week is Evening by Reiner Maria Rilke. I hope you will enjoy it. Here it is. Evening by Reiner Maria Rilke, translated by Stephen Mitchell. The sky puts on the darkening blue coat, held for it by a row of ancient trees. You watch, and the lands grow distant in your sight. One journeying to heaven, one that falls. And leave you, not at home in either one, not quite so still and dark as the darkened houses not calling to eternity with the passion of what becomes a star each night and rises, and leave you inexpressibly to unravel your life with its immensity and fear, so that, now bounded, now immeasurable, it is both stone in you and star. Stone in you and star. So that's what I'm going to leave you with, everybody. I hope you have a wonderful week ahead, wonderful month, if it's that long before I post again. And um, as I've said throughout, please leave comments, please subscribe, and uh, please ask questions, because uh, this is a lot more fun when it feels like we're having a conversation. So I uh, wish you all the best. Happy knitting, and I'll see you next time.